Yep. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone to the January 17th uh, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Uh, tonight on the agenda, we have four public hearings, one letter of recommendation, four information reports, one new correspondence item, and one preliminary plat recommendation report. Um, can I get a roll call of commission members, please? Commissioner Helfrey. Here. Commissioner Ward. Commissioner Cohn. Here. Commissioner Broyles. Here. Commissioner Clayton. Here. Commissioner Deppler. Here. Commissioner Jackson. Here. Chair Beatty. Here. Council Member Brost. Mayor Bolin. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I get an approval of the minutes from December 5th? Uh, motion by Commissioner Broyles, second by uh, Commissioner Clayton. Um, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, does the Department of Planning have any opening comments? Yes, Mr. Chair, just a couple. First of all, at the far right, or far right of the dais from my perspective is a gentleman named Brad Pryor. He's filling in for John Young tonight, so we'd like to welcome him and thank him. And then just so you're all aware, Obviously, we normally meet on the first Monday of the month, given the holidays, we're meeting on the third Tuesday of the month. So our next meeting is actually February 6th. So we're back on the first Monday. So we've got three weeks between it, but just wanted to let you know of the change. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, should I address the order of um, the agenda now or when we get after the public hearings. After the public hearings. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to open it for public comment. So if you have any comments uh, not related to one of the four public hearings, uh, now is your time to speak. And um, Mr. Newberry, if you can go ahead and call up any people who want to speak. I remember, uh, to, out of courtesy for everyone, please keep your comments to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Von der Hayden. And Mr. Chair, I'll give a notice when there's one minute left. Okay, thank you. Is the mic? Uh, good evening, my name is Betsy Van der Hayden. I live at 16560 Birch Forest Drive. And, uh, I'm going to read my comments that way I can stay on track and hopefully cover everything. But thanks for listening to this. Uh, these comments are being made to address the efforts of the planning department to amend the current regulations ordinances regarding solar modules in the city of Wildwood. Having read the information report, I'm both surprised and dismayed that the planning department is recommending options number two and number three to the planning and zoning commission. The process of installing solar in our community should be accessible to all residents of Wildwood. The two options recommended by the planning department will prohibit the installation of solar for all but the wealthiest residents in the city, those people who live on three plus acres of property. Of course, the um, those that have the back facing uh, lots like I have are at an advantage because you know, there is no um, uh, CUP that's required for that. But for everyone else, that could be an issue. So it's been almost a year since uh, the solar project at my home was completed. Being able to generate our own electricity has been amazing. Our goal is, com is to completely electrify our house during 2023. In 2022, we replaced our gas guzzling furnace with a high efficiency electric heat pump, which believe it or not, provided us with the coolest, most comfortable summer ever. And the highest Ameren bill was $48, which included the $9.14 customer charge that all of us pay. The bills from April through October ranged from $6 to dollars with some kind of credit uh, to $18, again, $9.14 included for the entire house. 
So while the savings are great and help pay for the solar array and electrical work over about a 15 year period, the benefits to our planet cannot be overlooked. With the Inflation Reduction Act rebates and tax credits in effect this year, we will be replacing our gas water heater with an ENERGY STAR high efficiency heat pump water heater. Our gas stove will be replaced with an induction stove and we will no longer burn natural gas in our home. With the purchase of an electric vehicle in the next year or two, we will be anticipating the addition of another four solar modules. We currently have 12 modules based off our original electric usage before the addition of all the electrical appliances. The placement of those additional modules under the current regulations would require a conditional use permit. Even though that roof line is located at the back of the house, its west facing surface is visible from Marsh Street. Not obtrusive at all, but visible. Based on options two or three, we would be prohibited from adding those additional panels, which we would really need to take care of our electrical needs. And it seems that these options are based solely on aesthetics. I would think that Wildwood would want to be viewed as an environmentally friendly place to live, that we can support our community with a smart, sustainable regulations and ordinances. Many more residents will be upset to find that Wildwood as a city is discouraging best practices regarding the environment. Three years ago, I retired after 37 years of teaching. I always included environmental lessons about conservation and energy for my primary age children. You know that, Ed. Um, with, we have a moral obligation to show the young people of our community in Wildwood values that, that Wildwood values individual responsibility and will not put obstacles in the way of positive environmental progress. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next. Mr. Roth. Hi, my name is Randall Roth. I'm at 2644 Wingcrest Ridge Drive. And I would like the committee to review a submitted or a series of ser uh, submitted written comments regarding over 25 families in the Wingcrest subdivision who have expressed a desire not to have front facing solar panels visible from an adjacent public street. Next, I would like to read the results of a study from the University of Rhode Island in an article by Isaac Orr, who is a policy fellow at the American Experiment. A newly released study from the University of Rhode Island has found that solar facilities reduce property values of for nearby properties. The study results are that solar is driving down property values. The study examined more than 400,000 housing transactions occurring within one to three miles of 208 different solar installations, meaning the findings are not simply a product of a smaller cherry pick sample. The results suggest that solar installations negatively affected nearby property values in the, in the treatment group, and the decline was 1.7% or approximately $5,751 relative to the control group. These findings suggest that solar create negative externalities, and the average household annual willingness to pay to avoid these externalities is $279. This helps explain local concerns and opposition and gives pause to current practices of not including proximate residents in sitting decisions or compensating them after uh, siting has occurred. The study also found that homes that are built closer to solar installations suffer a greater decrease in property value. Reductions in property value were also higher in suburban areas than areas that are less heavily populated. Additionally, solar advocates almost always try to say that solar is lower in cost than other sources of energy like coal, natural gas, or nuclear power by citing the subsidized cost of solar against the cost of building a new coal plant, gas plant, or nuclear power plant. But this is a dishonest comparison. Electricity demand has been flat in the United States for years, meaning we don't need new power plants. Therefore, the most honest comparison is to look at the cost of generating electricity at existing power plants against the unsubsidized cost of solar. 
One must also look at all the hidden costs of solar like transmissions, utility profits, additional property taxes, and the cost of load balancing or keeping reliable power sources online when the sun isn't shining or every single night. Once these costs are accounted for, solar is far more expensive to the tune of five times the traditional energy sources. So I wanted to share that. And then there've been a lot of comments regarding solar. And uh, I wanna share some words that are, uh, in the words of Mark Mills, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And hopefully you'll be able to hear this. We won't be able to finish it, but we have the- uh, Have you ever heard of some of Kenya? It's the magical energy mineral found on the planet Pandora in the movie Avatar. It's a fantasy in a science fiction script. But environmentalists think they found it here on Earth in the form of wind and solar power. They think all the energy we need can be supplied by building enough wind and solar farms and enough batteries. The simple truth is that we can't, nor should we want to. Not if our goal is to be good stewards of the planet. To understand why, consider some simple physics realities that aren't being talked about. All sources of energy have limits that can't be exceeded. The maximum rate at which the sun's photons can be converted to electrons is about 33%. Our best solar technology is at 26% efficiency. For wind, the maximum capture is 60%. Our best machines are at 45%. So we're pretty close to wind and solar limits. Despite PR claims about big gains coming, there just aren't any possible. And wind and solar only work when the wind blows and the sun shines, but we need energy all the time. The solution we're told is to use batteries. Again, physics and chemistry make this very hard to do. <clears throat> Consider the world's biggest battery factory, the one Tesla built in Nevada. It would take back the environment. You might want to rethink wind, solar, and batteries because, like all machines, they're built from non renewable materials. Consider some sobering numbers. A single electric car battery weighs a Building a single 100 megawatt wind farm can power 75,000 homes requires some 30,000 tons of iron ore, 50,000 tons of concrete, as well as 900 tons of non-recyclable plastics for the huge blades. To get the same power from solar, the amount of cement, steel, and glass needed is 150% greater. Then there's the other minerals needed, including elements known as rare earth metals. Is that it? But current right. plants, I'm sorry. the world will need yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. But environmentalists think. Mr. Scott. Good evening. My name is Glenn Scott. I live at 16247 Windcrest Ridge Court. Uh, I would like to speak on uh, the proposal to further increase restrictions on home solar. Uh, I'd like to start by addressing a concern about the environmental impact. Uh, I think uh, the Department of Planning and past conditional use permits has gone on record as saying solar panels are good for the environment. Um, so I believe that issue has been addressed. Uh, to address uh, Commissioner Helfrey's concern about uh, end-of-life disposal, uh, I would note that my panel proposal included a 30-year warranty, uh, meaning that the useful life of my panels is probably closer to 40 to 50 years, um, and a lot of things can happen with recycling in the next 40 to 50 years. Uh, they are certainly a better option than a one-time use uh, fossil fuel that must be trucked, gasoline must be trucked in uh, into the wildwood. Uh, I'd also like to uh, say that I believe that the a lot of good concerns have been raised by the Planning Commission, but I do believe that they have all been addressed uh, at the past four meetings uh, where we have been discussing this. Uh, there. So what is the real purpose here? I think looking at 16525 Rainforest Drive, 16514 Meadow Hawk Drive, 16707 West Glen Farms, and 16481 Forest Pine Drive, 
uh, as well as other instances where the city has issued conditional use permits allowing front facing solar or solar visible from adjoining or abutting streets shows that the despite the uh, public statement from the city attorney at the last meeting, the city of Wildwood does have a legal problem with fair and consistent issuance of conditional use permits for residential solar. Uh, the planning department has proposed three options uh, to help address this concern. Option one is to do nothing different, uh, which uh, is a problem because it doesn't address the, the fairness or inconsistency of the conditional use permit process. Option two is to keep the requirements the same, but eliminate the conditional use process uh, as a way of, of getting around the requirements. Uh, I do not believe that this is a good option because it is so strongly anti-solar and uh, it is against Wildwood's core values of respect for the environment. Uh, I do wanna mention here that there, I do not believe there's an option to say, I am in favor of solar, but if you're actively working to restrict and reduce solar that is available to the residents of Wildwood, you are anti-solar. So that only leaves option three. Option three seems to be a viable option uh, that needs a little bit more work. Uh, the proposal as written is not clear enough to be complied with by an engineer specifying a system. Um, the goal of option three, I believe, needs to be that most residents in the city of Wildwood can have residential solar enough to offset their annual electricity use. Um, this doesn't mean that every citizen in Wildwood will take advantage of this. One minute. But I believe that that needs to be the goal is to make that an option and, and have the standards written so that it, they can be clearly complied with to achieve that goal without the need for a conditional use permit. The number of conditional use permits even on the agenda tonight shows that there is increased demand in Wildwood for residential solar. And I would hope that the uh, government of Wildwood would be re responsive to the needs of the citizens. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Babb. Coming in my dancing clothes. <laughs> Um, I am Frances Babb, 2001 Kersdale Court in Clarkson Valley. I've been here a bunch of times before. Um, I want to um, let you know that I sent out to um, Joe and to Travis a document um, talking about option three. And can you give me some feedback um, non-verbally if you've had a chance to read it? Okay, we got one, two. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, I um, hope that option three um, is certainly better than the other two options. And I want to elaborate on this and point out two main points. Point number one is how can we make solar look more aesthetically pleasing? And um, I would say the way to do that is to minimize contrast between the solar and the roof that's you know, next to it or below it. And minimizing contrast in terms of color, texture, and shape. To minimize um, contrast in color, I would strongly recommend black panels with black frames and black back sheets. The um, all black look uh, eliminates the domino effect that solar with silver frames has on it. And the back sheet um, that's black eliminates the little tiny diamonds that are all over the panels. And it makes it look, in my opinion, a lot more seamless. So I would strongly recommend that if you're concerned about aesthetics. Um, the second thing my husband has a correction to um, my suggestion was to spray paint the rails and the flashings. 
Um, back in 2012, when we installed our system, the only rails and flashings that were available were silver. Now they're available in black and black is commonplace. So typically installers do not bother to uh, kill their finger with a can of spray paint the way that I had to do whenever that we installed our array. Um, he also commented that um, we didn't bother to paint our conduits like I said I did here, at least on our home in Clarkson Valley. But that is a suggestion, okay? Number two, minimize contrast. And that's where, Travis, I would like for you to bring up a picture, um, the third of the last picture. Um, in contrast, um, how do I say this? When there is a difference in texture and size um, of, of the panels and the roof, your eye is drawn to it in a way that um, you just you just notice it, you know. And I think if you can minimize contrast on the roof, I think that is better than having less contrast. And the way to do that is to, in my opinion, not make arrays smaller, but make arrays bigger cover more of the roof so there is less contrast. And hence in this picture that I have, I think this is a really nice looking array. It doesn't have four corners, but it has very little contrast. Um, and then um, solar shingles are certainly an option as far as shape is concerned, um, but they're so darn expensive, who's going to spend the money to do that? But there are solar triangles available. They're four times more expensive than regular solar panels. And I think that using solar triangles certainly deals with the zigzag look that solar panels have when you put them in a bowling pin kind of shape. And I would strongly recommend that if you're concerned yeah. about um, you know, the aesthetics of this. And the last thing, I, well, maybe second last thing I want to say is if I had to comply with option number three, um, I wouldn't have 100 solar panels anymore. I would lose the 48th in my, on the ground in the backyard, the 13 on the back of the house tilted up, and I would lose about 11 on the front of the house. And I would end up with um, a 72% reduction in my solar energy size. And that would make me extremely unhappy. And in my document, I talked about economically what that impact to me is. But the last, oh, very, last that time. Thing, very last thing I want to say, right forwards, I am a Republican. I am not a liberal Democrat, nor that much of an environmentalist. I am a very strong Trump supporting Republican. Thank you for your comments. Okay. The next speaker card? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Cartea. Hello, and thank you for listening to me. I uh, had no intention of talking, but I decided that I should because there's things that nobody has mentioned. Okay. Mr. Chairman, we oh, need a name, name and address, please. Name and address. Oscar Cartaya. My property in Wildwood is 1420 Shepherd. It's a three acre park. Uh, I live in Chesterfield. Okay. Uh, when you talk about solar panels, you're thinking about the ugly contraption that is shiny and it's blue and it's got aluminum on the sides and all that kinds of garbage. They sell roof tile that is electrical roof tile. Apple sells them, certain teeth sells them. They come in different colors. It looks like roof tile, exactly normal like roof tile. I have seen films of these things where they test it by dropping a 20 pound ball of steel from the height of a, of a the ladder down to the tile and it does not break. It's not cheap, but if you want aesthetic solution to solar, you could start thinking about solar tile. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Speak, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Bierman has his hand raised on Zoom, so okay. let him in.
Mr. Bierman, go ahead and state your name and address and go ahead and, and unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Scott Bierman. I live at 16347 Windcrest Falls Way in Wildwood, Missouri, 63005. Uh, we spoke before on this topic and uh, we've spoken with many neighbors. I think where we're at on this, the solar panel issue, the, and people have, have addressed it, is that they're just not attractive. And that's the reason why solar panels, people are fine with them going in the back of the building where they're not visible um, and an eyesore from the street. And we, you know, even the people in support of it agree that these are, are not attractive uh, devices. So um, the, the people, again, want to put this on the front of the house, and there are restrictions that prohibit that. Uh, the, the neighbors that, that live in the community all moved in with the understanding that those were the restrictions and, you know, wanted those maintained. Uh, the people that moved into the subdivision saw those restrictions and knew about them prior to them moving in and apparently agreed with them uh, or could have moved elsewhere. So the neighbors here don't want the aesthetic problems of the solar panels and the potential uh, property devaluation that, that occurs. Um, the other issue that was, that's been addressed is there are technologies on the horizon uh, that may make solar panels completely, as we see them, obsolete, such as the solar um, shingles. They're certainly more palatable and uh, possibly Wildwood would wait until such time as that those are more commonly available and or cost effective uh, to allow such panels. Uh, also on the horizon are motionless wind turbines, which are far more efficient than the panels. They're certainly uh, less attractive. So my, my concern would be that if we start letting panels in, uh, then maybe we allow more efficient technologies such as the windless um, or the motionless wind turbines uh, that can generate power around the clock. They're certainly not visually attractive, but they make more sense than solar panels do. And the concern is where, where does this end? Um, and I, I just like the, the panel to keep that in consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is that everyone? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair, the department has no additional speaker cards for the public comment session. All right. Um, oh. Mr. Cumley wishes to speak on one of the public hearing items. Um, he, Travis says you're here for one of the public hearings, rather. Yeah, so you'll right. get your chance in a minute. Really not the time to. You, okay. Correct. Not yet. All right. All right. Um, it looks like we do have one more on Zoom who raised their hand. Ms. Bates is on her way in. Okay. All right. Go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name and address, and go ahead. Hi. Um, well, my name is Charlotte Bates, and I'm representing Verizon Wireless, uh, the facility pardon me, facility that's located at 1222 Battler Park Drive. And then do you need my personal address? If so, no. that's okay. Um, anyway, this facility has been there for about 15 years and we're just seeking approval to amend the conditional use permit in order to modify the tower by up upgrading the equipment, ensuring service continues. And this will also um, make it enhance and enhanced with updated technology for all the customers. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, given that we have several people who've spoken on the solar issue, I would uh, ask if there might be an interest on the part of the commission in rearranging the agenda to move PZ 16-22 uh, next uh, so we could address that and, and then proceed with the other items out of courtesy to the people who are here on the issue tonight. That, that relates to solar panel? Well, um, I was going to move it so it's the first after the public hearings. Do we have a fair number of comments on the public hearings, Travis? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have one speaker who is not the representing the petitioner who would like to speak during one of the public hearings. The other cards we've received are the petitioners. Okay. Um, I, I would be okay with that then. Okay. 
All right. Well, so is, or, I, we need to make sure that the, the whole commission, yeah. if anybody well, else has a question. To take care of um, the PZ 16-22 um, before the public hearings. You're okay. Oh. Is it good? Um, I, uh, I, I need a motion, I guess. Well, we could do it by, I'll make a motion that we move 1622. Uh, we rearrange the agenda to now discuss uh, informational report relating to PZ 1622, which relates to our solar panel regulations. All right. Um, any discussion? All those in all three. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Opposed. All right. Um, think I think it was four to two. So motion carries. So if it's on the agenda at this point, then I would like to speak to it. Um. Should I have you? Uh, let me have Mr. Runich introduce it first. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, Mr. Chair, with your permission, if Mr. Newberry reads the request into the record, then I would defer some of my time to Mayor Bowen. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. PZ 16 22, City of Wildwood Planning and Zoning Commission, care of Department of Planning 16860 Main Street, Wildwood, Missouri 63040. A request to review amendments to regulations and requirements contained in Chapter 415 of the Zoning Ordinance of the City of Wildwood, Missouri, pertaining to roof mounted solar panels or other roof mounted solar energy systems within the residential zoning districts, R districts, and the NU non urban residence district, including but not limited to their installation in a manner where they are visible from an adjoining or adjacent roadway and the procedures for their approval, all wards. All right. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Vinich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I'd be glad to, to hold the... Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Department of Planning has prepared for your consideration tonight an information report with certain options related to front-facing solar panels. Obviously, some of the speakers have identified comments that they have provided, as well as the information they spoke to at the podium tonight. There are three options being proposed, and there's rationales for each of those three options. The first option is to continue forward with the set of regulations that are in place at this time and do nothing to change them. Obviously, the department did not believe that is a viable option, given the conversations the Planning and Zoning Commission has had over the past six plus months and the postponements that have been orchestrated to accommodate better visibility of potential for locations for front facing panels, etc. If we continue forward with the regulations as is, we're going to continue to have delays and in delays in the opinion of the department are an indication that the actual regulations are not as functional or appropriate as they need to be. Option two is to prohibit front facing solar panels. And that has been the conversation of the Planning and Zoning Commission on many of its meetings where solar panels of this nature have been presented via the CUP process. The department notes that this is a viable option given again past concerns of the city as represented by the Planning and Zoning Commission. An outright prohibition does bring clarity to the process so that property owners as well as installers know exactly what they can and cannot do. So delays associated with the process will be significantly reduced, but certainly it does impinge to a certain degree on the viability of certain locations for solar panel installations. The last option is to look at additional regulations for front-facing solar panels. The department identified five of them in that particular option. And what the department would say is it could be all five, it could be a combination of the five, it could be one of the five, or any that the Planning and Zoning Commission would like to add. 
the intent of this particular option is to basically say that in certain instances, front facing panels may be appropriate, but here are certain additional regulations that will ensure an increased level of compatibility and certainly allow for the generation of electricity through solar energy systems. The department did not select an option tonight, but did identify options two and three as the best of the ones provided to the Planning and Zoning Commission and is seeking direction tonight on which option the Planning and Zoning Commission supports. And once an option is chosen, whether it's two or three, then the city attorney and the department would prepare the letter of recommendation in draft form with the regulations in place so as they can be reviewed and acted upon by the commission at that particular meeting. So tonight, the department is presenting the three options with an inclination towards options two or three, again, for the reasons stated, and that there are um, certainly technology is going to eventually address many of the issues we have regarding aesthetics. And I also believe the recycling component. But again, tonight we're working in 2023 and we have to do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Bullen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm going to make ultimately two motions, uh, one dealing with the regulations and, and the second dealing with destruction of solar panels. But I'll go with the, the larger issue first. Um, and to put this in context, um, we've had a, at least two meetings in regard to this where we receive public testimony. And I think it's important to note that of all the speakers we have had speak on this issue at those two meetings, with the exception of two speakers who were Wildwood residents, all other speakers, uh, I'm sorry, two speakers who were Wildwood residents or those who have a current request for solar panels before this commission, every other speaker uh, was in fact not from the city of Wildwood. Um, second, this is not a debate about whether we are in favor of solar panels. I think everyone on this bench, I would predict, is very much in favor of solar panels, myself included. Um, it is a debate about aesthetics for our community. Um, we do this, this being a debate and making decisions about aesthetics in a variety of angles and contexts. For example, we do not allow water heaters to be located on the outside of homes, even though in hot weather they might be more efficient. We do not allow certain types of roofs that are not aesthetically appropriate for our city, even though they might be more energy efficient. Um, as the department has noted in its report, we have to be concerned about uh, the workability of our rules, whether they're on this or about this or any other matter. And I've been concerned, and this is the reason that I've, I've raised this previously, um, it, I don't think it's good and we're probably going to hear this tonight, in fact, with respect to a request for solar panels, that's a new one, um, I will predict. Uh, it, it's not good for us to have rules that give rise to disparate or different results. Um, those, those things end up aggravating our citizens. They lack consistency. Um, and for a number of other reasons, I just, I would submit their ill advice. So my first motion is that we ask the department to prepare a draft of legislation that would affect the third option, uh, that option being um, to allow, continue to allow front facing solar panels, but the legislation would, um, would, would examine and require rather the, the, the panels not be visible in some instances, that might be because of the lot size, but in other instances, it might be because of the location of the home. It might be because of vegetation that is uh, currently present, trees, or is proposed. So uh, in that manner, it would it would ameliorate the chance that um, the, the ultimate legislation that comes back to the commission, if it's passed, uh, does not treat our residents differently from one side of 109 to the other. So that is my motion, that we see what that legislation would look like, and we take it from there.
Is there a second? Commissioner Helfrey. Mayor Boland, could you restate that a little bit? More? Sure. So the motion would be that we ask the department to prepare legislation for this commission to consider. It doesn't mean we're going to adopt it, but that we consider the legislation and that legislation would limit front face, would limit solar panels that are front facing when they are visible. Um, and so they, they would be a they would be allowed, but if they're on a large lot that's not visible, to, you know, they're not. That means they're not visible to the street. Uh, you know, they would be allowed there if if they have vegetation, trees, whatever that that are either currently on the, their lot, regardless of the size, or they propose to add that those trees and vegetations to shield them. They would be allowed if their home is in a certain location, regardless of lot size, where you can't see it from the street. They would be allowed. Otherwise, they would not be. And so I would just like to see that legislation before we make a final decision on it. But that is that is the concept, because I think that um, and I sort of get to that just so you know, if I may explain it really as the lesser uh, what I could what I believe to, the, to be the lesser of the three evils, so to speak, that's being presented. Uh, the current approach that we're dealing with, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks earlier, I don't think is workable because it is giving rise to disparate different results. Um, and and all the antagonism that's eventually going to come from that. Number two, um, I don't know that I've personally reached a point, although I could maybe get there. I'd like to just take it in baby steps uh, with the commission and see what we could do as a path of least resistance before uh, you know going down the road of just simply prohibiting them in their entirety. Um, although if this motion fails and someone makes that motion, I would probably support it. So this is this is what I consider to be the best of the three options. And I would at least like to see what that legislation would look like and have some debate with the commission as to um, what the, the conditions of continuing to allow them would be uh, before making a final decision on it. So that's my motion. I'd like to ask the mayor on legislation, you mean something that's going to lead to an ordinance? Correct. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Yep. Commissioner Halfrey. Okay, so my question, for Mayor Bolin is that with your recommendation mm -hmm. or motion, would that include these um, five items that the Department of Planning has put together? Or is that in lieu of these? On what page? It's on page four of PZ 1622 in their, uh, in their analysis, where they state option three, they have five uh, considerations. One is four corners, one is a percent of the square footage, one uh, is critter guards, one is types of materials with non-glare, and uh, the fifth one is um, certain flexibility with items one through four. Okay, just bear with me a moment. Sure. No, I printed it, right? So my motion does not uh, necessarily indicate that the department would include a consideration of those five things, but if if it were the wish of the commission, I would have, but I would have no problem including those to the extent solar panels are allowed on front facing homes to include an analysis of these five things. I'm happy if there's unanimity and agreement to make that part of the motion. So I'm not opposed to that, but my motion did not include those. Okay, so I'm going to restate in my mind what you said. I apologize, but I want to make sure that I know what I'm voting on. What I hear in your, what you've said is there's three options in your option. One is that if they are not visible, they can have front facing. And if they are visible, then you would put these things in to see if they meet these criteria. I or did. is it no, they, if they are visible, then, then it's no. So I think the five criteria you're referring to don't necessarily relate to visibility. They were, I mean, they might, but they, they relate to, uh, I Aesthetics. think, yes, in some degree, but my motion was um, more of a macro. The, these tend to be, I, I view these five as micro. Um, my motion was they would be allowed if they cannot be seen. 
um, whether they have critter guards or not. They, they you know, as right. shown in number three here, uh, if they can't be seen, whether by virtue of the placement of the lot vis-a-vis -vis the street or vis-a-vis -vis other residences or the size of the lot or vegetation and trees. That said, I don't have a problem with these be, these five being mm -hmm. part of um, the department's analysis in, in what it returns. And I'll just make that as part of my motion, since it hasn't been seconded, that these five would also be part of the analysis. Okay, so I will second the mayor's motion to, to ask you to present, present something to us so that we have something that we can see visually, because, uh, you know, with me and my highlighter, I have to see and read it to understand it. So I would second the motion that you put something together for us uh, so that we can read it and go from there. Thank you for. You're welcome. Thank you for the second. Any further, any further discussion? I have, I have something. Commissioner Jackson. <clears throat> I'm, I'm okay whether we include it or we don't address it another time. It came up in the emails that's here. I've, and I've always had not an issue, but a concern of the upkeep when you put any renewable, it doesn't matter if it's solar or whatever, because you are your own little power plant. And I don't think we have enough safeguards in place, whether that be, I always talked about home inspection or inspe ongoing inspection of proper disposal, batteries. We always talk about batteries, but Ms. Helfrey sent some, sent some great information on the solar panels themselves. Inverters have to be replaced from time to time. There's no safeguards in place. So I would like to see some that we're going to look at an ordinance, a holistic. Now, I would I don't care if it's part of this or at a later date. I don't want to jumble it up. Just bring that up. That's actually, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that's going to be my second motion, part of my second motion. Okay, I'm done. Yeah. All right. Um, any further discussion? All right, roll call on the first motion. Commissioner Cohn. Yes. Commissioner Broyles. Yes. Commissioner Clayton. Yes. Commissioner Deppler. Yes. Commissioner Jackson. Yes. Commissioner Helfrey. Yes. Chair Beatty. No. Mayor Bolin. Yes. Thank you. And if I may make my second mm -hmm. motion, Mr. Chairman. So my second motion is that we also ask the department to uh, provide the commission with um, its recommendation relative to whether there should be a, a new ordinance relating to the um, ongoing assessment of safety and particularly uh, the struck, well, ongoing assessment of solar panel safety, as well as uh, whether there should be any um, any new regulations relating to their destruction within the city of Wildwood. Right. Um, uh, Commissioner Halfrey. Well, my comment to that is that I think that that there should be some uh, legislation going forward about solar panels because they are renewable energy, but in all of the documentation that I've read, there is, they're great for the person that's having them. And everybody, or many people have spoken about environmentally friendly and all of these things. But in my email, I wrote um, that if we are actually doing this for good planning practices and for um, what was the other, uh, promote public health, then we need to follow it through all the way to the end. And in everything that I've read, it the um, when these solar panels are no longer usable, it's what happens to them then. I'm not opposed to solar. I'm not opposed to solar panels. But I think that if we're going to be environmentally um, responsible, then that does mean that we should follow it through to the end and have an answer for what happens when these solar panels do stop working or if there's a tornado and there is damage to a solar panel or any number of things, I think that it is irresponsible to not have some sort of guidance for people that purchase them as much as people that sell them in Wildwood. And um, for those of you that don't know, there's a lot of information out there that you can look for. And um, there are some states that have, very few states have regulations on it um, because it's not the happy part of the conversation. But I think that that's, uh, so I personally would like to see legislation for that. Is that a second? Yes. 
All right. Any discussion on the second motion? Uh, yes. Oh. Whenever. Commissioner Boylson. Um, I remember, um, Paul, for you, when you read that information to the commission, and it was very helpful. And that puzzled me as to how they are taken care of once they are damaged or removed in, for some reason. I'd like that to be an integral part of that legislation eventually. Commissioner Jackson. Yeah, so I guess the question is how deep do you want to go, right? Do you want to go all the way to how do you catch these? There's got to be intervals every five years you're going to inspect it or someone with subject matter expertise, any renewables, for instance, I would look at not just solar. Or is it a catch-all when home sell? We don't do home inspections here. I know that was something that you were looking at. How deep do you want to go? I mean, how deep do we want to go as a city? I mean, but something has to happen because you're your own power generation plan at this point. And we have a lot of wells too. So anything that bioaccumulation, contamination, God forbid it goes down into a well, a battery gets turned over, they're sealed, but if it gets broke, a tornado, you, you name it. Uh, but somehow I just think, you know, there's got to be some sort of time intervals. So. Um, um, sir. Okay. So anyway, I just kind of think, I would think in intervals is a suggestion, fine. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I would just say that um, we would, I would suggest we let the department relative to Commissioner Jackson's comments, um, which are very salient, um, you know, assess that and make a determination as to the depth. And if the department ultimately believes we need, if we, we don't have the resources to go deep enough, then he can advise and, and we can take it from there. Mr. Chair, if I Yes, may. sir. As you'll recall, in 2018, we did update our regulations, and one of the new regulations that was added to the list came from Mr. Jackson. And we do require under a conditional use permit that if a system of solar panels, regardless of front facing or not, is either abandoned, removed, or replaced, that property owner is required to contact the city and advise where they are going to be disposed of. We have that limited protection in place per the 2018 action of the commission, but certainly there could be more. And you know, one thing I forgot, transferable on cell phone, whether you do home inspections or not, make sure that that's in there, that that's the known responsibility of whoever owns the problem. And just to update you on the home inspection item, uh, our city attorney, Mr. Young, is looking into that, and we hope to have something back to you um, in the next quarter uh, for consideration. Any further discussion on the motion? All right, uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Broyles. Commissioner Clayton. Yes. Commissioner Deppler. Yes. Commissioner Jackson. Yes. Commissioner Helfrey. Yes. Commissioner Cohn. Yes. Chair Beatty. No. Mayor Bolin. Yes. Thank you. And if I could just uh, make one final comment on the first motion, please, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. I would just ask, and this may be more of a, a request of our uh, legal representative, but to both he and the department, um, obviously, as we do with any regulation, when you come back with these, but particularly the first one, I mean, the absence, uh, you know, it may be difficult to, to strike the balance, but I don't think we want to have a situation like we have now with a lot of ambiguity. So, you know, to the extent you can make it what I would call hard and fast um, and easily recognizable with the public and the commission and and whomever, uh, so much the better. So thank you. And thanks to each of you for your support of the motions. I appreciate it. All right. Um, this time we'll come back to our public hearings. In the city of Wildwood, public hearings are truly intended to accept comments and questions concerning these items. Since these requests are being presented at a public hearing, no action is planned on these items tonight and consideration of them is to be taken no earlier than the February or March 2023 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. 
This approach ensures the members of the commission will hear all opinions before taking any action. The city's Department of Planning will address the comments, questions, and concerns that are raised tonight and include them as part of its formal recommendation to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Anyone in attendance at City Hall tonight and wanting to speak should fill out a speaker card and leave it with Mr. Newberry. Those in attendance via the Zoom webinar platform um, should use the raise hand feature to indicate you wish to speak at these hearings. A team member will add you to the list of speakers, which will then be communicated to me as chair, and I will invite you to speak when it is your turn. The commission will allow all parties adequate time to present their position, but all speakers are limited to five minutes each. Speakers will be advised when one minute is left in the allotted time. In addition, information on these items can be found on the city's website at www.cityofwildwood.com. The commission would like to thank you for your cooperation and participation in tonight's hearings. All right, uh, Mr. Newberry, PZ 20-22. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with your permission, the department will read both PZ 20-22 and 21-22 in tandem because they are related to the same proposal. Sounds good. Thank you. PZ 20-22 Greenberg Development Company, LLC, PO Box 486, Wildwood, Missouri 63038. A request for the modification of the town center regulating plan for a 4.6 acre tract of land that is currently designated by it as workplace district to the neighborhood general district to accommodate its use for a maximum of 11 single family detached dwellings on individual lots and associated parking areas. Street address 16795 Manchester Road, St. Louis County locator number. 24V630312, northwest corner of Manchester Road and Taylor Road intersection, located in Ward 8. PZ21-22, Greenberg Development Company, LLC, PO Box 486, Wildwood, Missouri, 63038, a request for a change in zoning for a total of five properties that are currently designated either amended C8 planned commercial district, street addresses 16720 and 16780 Main Street, St. Louis County locator numbers 23V310581 and 23V310561. C8 planned commercial district, street address 16700 Main Street, St. Louis County locator number 23V310570, and NU non urban residence district, street addresses 16795 and 16727 Manchester Road, St. Louis County locator numbers 24V630303 and 24V630312 to the second amended. C8 Plan Commercial District, street addresses 16720 and 16780 Main Street, St. Louis County, locator numbers 23V310581 and 23V310561, amended C8 Plan Commercial District and C8 Plan Commercial District, including a conditional use permit, street addresses 16700 Main Street and 16795 and 16727 Manchester Road, St. Louis County, locator numbers 23V310570, 24V630 312 and 24V630303, all in association with an overall tract of land that is 11.8 acres, which would thereby authorize a mixed use development in the city's town center area, such to be located on the west side of Taylor Road between Main Street and Manchester Road. Proposed uses all C2 shopping districts permitted and conditional uses, a maximum of 189 multiple family units and a maximum of one, oh, excuse me, 11 single family detached dwellings on individual lots, along with public space, pickleball courts and others, stormwater management facilities and parking areas, Ward 8. All right. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Vinich. Mr. Chair, with your permission and that of the commission, just a quick note regarding the zoning district designations that have been read into the record. As you can see, there are five properties involved in this particular proposal, four of which are on the west side of Taylor Road, one of which is on the east side of the same. The properties have had a long history of rezoning, some prior to the corporation of the city and then others thereafter. So from that perspective, that's the nature of the kind of long advertisement. It's just got a long zoning history and there are multiple properties. Mr. Chair, with your permission, Ms. Ripito has a slide presentation for the commission right. and the public. Sounds good, Ms. Ripito. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. The, the department would like to start our slideshow with an overview map of the area. As you can see, um, it's in the heart of town center and to the south is higher density residential and to the north is primarily commercial. Um, 
There we go. Okay. Well, uh, the next slide is um, zoomed in an aerial of the same sites. And as uh, Mr. Vunich described, you can see the larger area of the site to the west of Taylor Road and the uh, smaller area um, on the east. Um, uh, the next photograph is a photograph taken from Maine looking south, um, overlooking the uh, larger area of the site. Um, and this is from Taylor looking west. Uh, you can see the theater in the background as well as the hotel. Uh, uh, the following, this is another um, photograph of the main uh, area of the site from Manchester Road looking north um, towards the commercial area. This is uh, towards the center of the property from Taylor uh, looking south. And this is from the same area looking north, as you can see that there's a bit of an elevation change um, in that area. Um, just to give a general um, overview of the area surrounding, uh, this is a photograph um, from Main Street looking west. This is, again, same location looking north towards other commercial area. This is looking east. Um, and this is also looking east, and it also um, shows you the relationship with the uh, properties across the street, the um, four, four and a half acre lot um, that is also part of this proposal. Um, this is a better picture of that site. Um, towards uh, at the end of Taylor is the roundabout that you're familiar with. Um, and this is looking um, east on Manchester Road. Um, from below the larger area of the parcel to the west of Taylor. Um, this is looking north um, towards the 4.6 acre parcel on the west side of the single family home that is not part of the development. And the next uh, photograph is the other side of that home also looking north. And this is um, along Manchester Road, looking east from that section um, to the west again would be the roundabout. And across the street are single family homes. And uh, the next slide is the site plan of the overall site, which includes um, the five parcels um, to the west of Taylor, as well as the 4.6 acre tract of land to the right. Um, and with that, that concludes the department's presentation. However, the applicant is here to present on uh, this agenda item and the department is here for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ripito. Thank you. Um, yeah, would the applicant like to go ahead and make their presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Mayor Bolin. Um, my name is Michael Doster. I am the land use attorney on the development team for the petitioner. My address is 16150 Main Circle Drive, Chester Road, Missouri, 63017. I'm here just to make a few introductory uh, remarks on behalf of the petitioner, which is Greenberg Development Company. As uh, some of you may know, maybe all of you know, that the petitioner has been a participant in the development of the town center. Some examples of that participation include the development and part ownership of the theater, uh, donation of land for City Hall, uh, facilitation of the development of the Deerberg Shopping Center, and prior to incorporation, the petitioner worked with MoDOT to move Phil from the area of the signalized intersection at Taylor Road and Highway 100, and after incorporation, uh, worked uh, with MoDOT to acquire right-of-way for South Taylor Road. Uh, the petitioner believes that what is missing from town center is luxury, high density residential use needed to support the existing and future retail in town center. What petitioner is proposing to develop are luxury apartments with amenities that will be attractive to professionals and Wildwood residents who want to downsize. To make this feasible, all of the parcels included in the proposed development must be collectively developed. Uh, Mr. George Stock, a civil engineer, will present the proposed plan. All right. Thank you. 
Mr. Stock? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. For the record, my name is George Stock, Mayor Bolin. Um, my address is 257 Chesterfield Business Parkway. Uh, that is St. Louis, Missouri, 63005. As Mr. Doster indicated, I'm part of the development team uh, for the Greenberg development. Also joining us this evening is the balance of our team. They'll be joining by virtual and they'll be available to answer any questions. Uh, included is um, from Humphreys Partners, the architects out of uh, Dallas is Zai Chin. Uh, also from Lockmiller Group is Ms. Julie Nofo. And then our landscape architect uh, is with Loomis and Associates is uh, Rusty Saunders. So a little bit about this, the site, and thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Ripito, for your description. But uh, plan view, aerial view of the site is uh, depicted on the screen. The property is located at the northwest quadrant of Manchester Road and Taylor Road, just south of Main Street. It totals 9.85 acres. Um, this also includes a current dedicated Eastgate Lane of 24 feet in width. Also included is approximately 2.1 acres, which is located at the northeast quadrant of Manchester and Taylor Road. Uh, dimensionally, this site is a, a lo long rectangle. Uh, it has frontage on Main Street of approximately 554 feet, along Taylor Road, roughly 781 feet, and then along Manchester Road, 363 feet. Uh, the parcel that's on the east side of Taylor Road along the Deerberg's access, which is the north line, roughly 285 feet, along Taylor, 382, and then along Manchester Road, approximately 163. Uh, the site topography slopes from north to south, um, high elevation along Main Street at 646, and then it falls down to Manchester Road where it's at elevation 711. Uh, the east side of the site uh, also falls from north to south, with an intermittent stream uh, bifurcating it from west to east, but it slopes from 725, roughly elevation 692. Uh, the property on the west side has been generally mass graded and developed. Uh, it has also put in adequate sanitary and storm sewers, which are shown on the graphic representation as green and orange running through the site. There's also a regional stormwater basin that was put in with the original Wildwood Town Center. It's located immediately south of the B&B Theater. The balance of the site will be managed within the site with new nestled bioretention basin in order to meet both the city's and the Metropolitan St. Louis Sewer District's stormwater regulations. Uh, the perimeter streets being Main Street uh, affords this development diagonal parking and along Taylor Road, there's also parallel parking. A little bit about the proposed conditions and the preliminary site plan. Uh, this project's going to include two residential multifamily buildings uh, both facing Main Street and Taylor Road. Uh, they're labeled on this drawing as the West Building and the East Building. I'll start with the West Building, which is immediately adjacent to the B&B Theater um, and, and immediately to the east of the B&B Theater and west of the existing Eastgate Drive, which is 24 feet wide today, to be widened to 26 in order to satisfy the fire marshal. This particular building will be four stories. That'll be three stories of residential over one story of retail and the building will contain 24 units. Also included will be rooftop amenity area and patios on both the east and the west side. The eastern building, which is east of Eastgate Lane, fronts Main Street. It's five stories tall along Main Street, and then it continues five stories going south on Taylor for approximately uh, 93 feet. Uh, this would be four stories of residential over retail space. This building includes a total of 165 units. It also includes amenities being indoor and outdoor pool, meeting rooms, retail space, and indoor fitness center. Outdoor pool, not an indoor pool. Um, the total units breakdown is 108 two bedroom, two bath, and 88 one bedroom, one bath. Um, the minimum size is 755 square feet. The largest is 1,272 for an average of 1,050 square feet. The total ground floor area, first floor facing Main Street is 22,000 square feet. 13,000 square feet of this would be retail space and 9,000 would be related to the multifamily, perhaps the fitness center or leasing office. Supporting the residential units and retail are surface parking, which totals 289 spaces, including 30 covered and two electrical vehicle charging stations. Vehicular access to the parking is via Eastgate Lane, 
a public street, which, as I mentioned before, will vary in size from 26 to 24 feet. Primarily, it's 26 feet from Main Street in between the multifamily, and then it tapers down to 24 feet for the balance, and then where it intersects out onto Taylor Road. The total parking for the development is 396 spaces. Uh, spaces in addition to the 289 I mentioned are along Taylor Road. There's 18 parallel spaces. Along Main Street, there's 30 diagonal spaces. And then there are pickleball courts that are also associated with this project on that east parcel, and there's a total of 48 spaces. South of the two residential buildings are 11 single-family residential lots, which would vary in size from 3,996 to 5,965 square feet. These lots front Manchester Road and Taylor Road. They create the transitional from the residential, single-family residential on the south side, moving to single-family residential on the north side, and as you progress through the site to the multifamily development. The vehicular access is off Eastgate Lane, which would service the back of these 11 residential homes. Each home would also provide its parking on the lot itself. Located on the east side of Taylor Road is an amenity area, which includes two pickleball courts, 48 parking spaces, and open space totaling approximately 2.1 acres. Next is our landscape plan prepared by Loomis and Associates. Um, today, the site consists of primarily of open fields and portions of the sites west of Taylor Road are populated with tall grasses and voluntary Calary Bradford pear of small caliber. On the site east of Taylor Road, a significant portion of the site is populated by an oak hickory woodland consisting of six to 20 inch caliber trees of fair condition on the central and northern portion of this track. On the southern portion of the track is woodland six to 12 inch elm and maple woodland of poor to fair condition. I think as the exhibits that uh, Ms. Ripito or the photograph showed, they're inundated by invasive honeysuckle. Street trees are located in tree pockets along both Taylor Road and Main Street. There are no grand trees found on this development site. There is a tree um, that's identified in tree stand delineation, which is actually off the property at the southwest corner. Um, it is a 24 inch pine uh, on the neighboring property and it is rated as a grand tree. So as such, measures will be taken to provide tree protection measures for this tree and other offsite trees along the western boundary. Again, I think in Ms. Ripito's photographs looking uh, west on Manchester Road, you were able to see the evergreen that I'm describing. Uh, tree preservation. Measures will also be utilized with the existing woodlands on the southern half of the property east of Taylor Road. New street trees would be placed throughout the development within all the new special sidewalks, paving patterns. Landscape buffers will be installed behind the new residential lots and for screening for trash enclosure. Parking lots will be landscaped with canopy trees, evergreen trees, and shrubs. The extension of the trail, which currently runs from west to east on the south side of the regional stormwater basin, would be continued through the development connect with the sidewalks on Eastgate Lane, and then continue through a green promenade between the um, northern east building and the south parking lot connecting out to Taylor Road. All in total, there's a new canopy trees uh, to be planted of 157, ornamental trees 25, and evergreen trees of 54. With regards to the architecture, as I mentioned, Humphreys and Associates out of Dallas, Texas is the architect. Uh, the next four slides would demonstrate um, the elevations. This first slide is the south elevation and west elevations of the west building. So looking at the top, that would be from the southern parking lot, looking at the building where you have the first floor retail, three stories of residential, and then you have the west elevation, which would be towards the B&B theater. Uh, this would be the Main Street elevation, standing on Main Street, looking at the building itself. The materials are generally glazing, two types of brick, and then fiber boards make up the majority of the architecture. Um, this is the five-story uh, building, which uh, steps down to four stories. Um, you have the Manchester Road elevation or the south elevation, and then you have the Taylor Road, um, which is basically looking west as you see the four stories. And as I mentioned, there's about 93 feet of five-story on Taylor Avenue before it turns the corner. And then you have the Main Street elevation. Um, and again, you see the first floor retail, then you see the four stories of residential above. 
And then you have the Eastgate Lane, which generally mimics the profile of the building that you saw a moment ago on Taylor Avenue, where it's five stories, then stepping down to four stories. With regards to this design and the architecture, you know, it's it's the belief that this mixed use development will be a catalyst. It will One continue, minute, please. continue the goals of the city. It provides the community with a dynamic and vibrant town center. Uh, the mixed use buildings physically define the streets as places. I'll move through these as some bird's eye views, just looking down as with the placement of the buildings. We could look at those. With regards to traffic, Julie Nofo, Lock Miller Group has prepared the traffic study. First and foremost, it was done in accordance with the scoping outline meeting between the city and MoDOT. Uh, study was completed, submitted to the city um, last week. And basically there's minimal increase. There's a trip generation, which shows 119 cars in the AM, 172 in the PM. The single lane roundabout has plenty of capacity. There's no need for direct access to Manchester Road, and there's no need for any physical improvements. Oh. T time. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, does the petitioner have anyone else who'd like to speak? Mr. Chair, under our bylaws, the petitioner gets up to 15 minutes mm -hmm. between Mr. Stock and Mr. Doster. They've used up that amount of oh, time. Oh, okay. All right. Um, are there any comments from the commission? I just have a question. Uh, Mayor Bullen. Uh, and this is through the chair to Mr. Benich. Is there any action you're looking for on the part of the commission this evening? No, sir. The department will prepare an information report with recommendation. That would be the first action. We hope to have that either at the first meeting in February or certainly no later than March. Okay, thank you. Do we have any speaker cards on this one? Mr. Chair, I received one speaker card from Mr. Cumley. Uh, I don't believe he's in attendance still, but if he is, Mr. Cumley. Not seeing any sign of him. So, And there are no hands raised on Zoom either. Okay. That's true. Thank you. All right. In that case, a uh, motion to close the public hearing. Commissioner Helfrey? All right. Is there second by Commissioner Broyles. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Any abstain? Abstain. All right. All right. So public hearing is closed with uh, Commissioner Cohn abstaining. Uh, Mr. Newberry, PZ1-23. PZ 1 23, Joy A. Wilcox Living Trust, 17345 Manchester Road, Wildwood, Missouri 63038. A request for a change in zoning from the amended C8 planned commercial district, Town Center Historic Pond District, to the R1 one acre residence district, Town Center Historic Pond District, for a one acre tract of land that is located on the north side of Manchester Road, west of Pond Road. Locator number 23W220207. Street addresses 17345 and 17351 Manchester Road. Proposed uses, all permitted uses being set forth in Chapter 415.110 R1, one acre residence district, Ward 1. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Vinich. Mr. Chair, with your permission and the commission's, just a quick note regarding the regulating plan relative to this particular site. As you know, the regulating plan of the town center plan sets forth land use categories. This particular site is in the Pond Historic District, and therefore in the Pond Historic District has a wide range of uses. This particular lot has a very long history. It was part of the famous Route 66, the Mother Road and was a commercial entity across from the Big Chief Roadhouse. More recently, the city of Wildwood formalized the commercial use with the CA Plan Commercial District, and tonight the petitioner is seeking to change that to the R1 one-acre resident district to accommodate the residents more so than the commercial use. But again, as part of the Pond Historic District, there is a range of uses allowed. Thank you. And Ms. Ripito does have a short slide presentation for your consideration. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vunich. Mr. Ripito. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Um, the department will again start this uh, presentation with an overview of the site. Um, as you can see, the site is located in the center of this and um, surrounded by a variety of commercial and residential located in the town center. Um, this is an aerial of the site. As you can see, there isn't a whole lot of grade change um, and it fronts on Manchester Road to the south. Um, this next photograph is of the west side of the property taken from the school's parking lot. Uh, you can see the fence that runs along the property line um, and the uh, side of the building. Um, this is taken from Manchester Road looking north um, towards the commercial area of the building or of the property. And this is again looking north, but this is the residential component of the property. Um, this is taken from the eastern edge of the property. So you can see the um, overall yard space and the uh, side of the home. Um, this is again taken looking north on Manchester Road um, towards the entrance of the commercial uh, components parking area. Uh, and this is the gravel parking area in the rear of the lot and the rear of the structures, as well as the associated yard area. Um, this uh, photograph is taken from Manchester Road looking west along Manchester. And this is looking east along Manchester Road. And this is Big Chief across the street um, from the site. Uh, this is a site plan provided by the applicant showing the overall site um, area. And with that, that concludes the department's presentation. However, the applicant is here to present during this public hearing, and the department will be here uh, for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ripito. Thank you. Um, would the applicant like to speak? Good evening. I'm Joy Wilcox. I'm the owner of the property. And I'm going to keep this very short. I've owned this property for most of 33 years. I'm at the stage that this is the best for me. I'm finally at that point in my life, best for me. And I'm asking you to please approve this for me. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from the commission? All right, um, seeing none, uh, motion to close the public hearing. Mr. Uh, Chair, oh, yes, sir. excuse me. Oh, uh, sorry. Just for the record, uh, there are no cards, speaker yeah. cards that have been submitted other than Mr. There Marcos. are none? No, there okay. are none. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Helfrey. All right, is there a second? Commissioner Clayton? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right, that public hearing is now closed. Um, next on the public hearing, Next public hearing in our last one, PZ 2-23, um, Mr. Newberry. PZ 2-23, Ali Abar and Caitlin Abdulhoseni, 17575 Thunder Mountain Road, Wildwood, Missouri, 63025, care of ADT Solar and Jessica P Pettit, 128 North Park Boulevard, Covington, Louisiana, 70433. They request for a conditional use permit CUP in the NU non-urban residence district for the installation of roof-mounted solar panels, which are to be so situated on a dwelling as to be visible from the adjoining private roadway, with such being located at 17575 Thunder Mountain Road, St. Louis County, locator number 27W31007 78 street is street address 17575 thunder mountain road this request is to be reviewed in accordance with chapter 415.090 in you non-urban residence district regulations of the city of wildwood zoning ordinance which establishes standards and requirements for the installation of solar panels the requested permit is required due to the panels placement on the front facing area of the roof of the dwelling thereby causing them to be visible from the adjoining roadway 25 panels ward six thank you mr newberry ms Ripito. Good evening. Um, thank you uh, again. Uh, the department has a brief presentation uh, that will once again start with the um, 
overview map that shows the site, uh, this, uh, the subject site that was just read into record. Um, as you can see, it's surrounded by other large lot subdivisions um, as well as under or undeveloped areas. Um, the next slide is an aerial, uh, maybe. There we go. Uh, is an aerial of the subject site. Um, as you can see from the elevations shown on this, the, there are some pretty dramatic um, elevation changes in this area. Um, uh, this uh, photograph was taken from the road and it is of the uh, existing home on which the solar panels are proposed um, and the house sits um, lower than the road. Um, this is an accessory structure also on the subject site. Um, this is from a little bit further down the property, uh, again, looking at the uh, subject uh, or the house on the subject property, uh, as well as this one. Um, this is looking north um, on the road from the subject property. And this is looking south um, also on Thunder Mountain Road. And this is uh, from Thunder Mountain Road, looking directly across the street from the subject site. Um, this is uh, a site plan provided by the applicant of uh, the site showing the solar arrays on the, uh, the proposed solar area on the roof of um, the home. And with that, that con concludes the department's presentation and the applicant is here to present on this item for the public hearing. The department will be here for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ripito. Thank you. Um, would the applicant like to speak? Mr. Chair, Mr. Ingram is representing the applicant and is on Zoom. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, for letting me speak tonight. I, I guess it's state like, your name and address first. Sorry. All right. It's it's John Ingram, and I'm with ADT Solar, and I'm representing the uh, the company and the and the uh, homeowner for this petition or for this proposal. Uh, address for me is six zero zero three West one hundred fifty seventh Place, Overland Park, Kansas six six two two three. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Um. Uh, I would like to just reiterate uh, what was just said in the in the previous presentation, and that is that uh, not only is the house 148 feet away from Thunder Road, but also 30 feet down from the from the elevation of Thunder Road. Uh, the uh, I'd like to point out that the uh, visibility of the house is somewhat limited, or is is greatly limited, and if you were to actually try to look and see the house as you're driving up the road, you would probably be driving off the road because of the bend that takes place at that point where the house is located. Uh, we are uh, proposing to put panels on the front facing roof portion that's down low. Uh, Mr. Newberry, is there a way that I can share my screen um, my, I, that I have over here? Yes, sir. Where do I do that? Uh, at the lower part of your Zoom screen, there should be a green button with an up arrow that says share screen. Okay, great. Oh, here we go. Terrific. Um, let's do, this is, can you see this now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, as you can see, the the roof itself, and and, and as you were discussing earlier in your uh, in your discussion about how to regulate uh, solar panel projects within your within the city limits. Uh, one advantage that we do have with this project is that it, it already is a very dark roof. We're proposing to go with black panels with black frames uh, that has very limited silver busing inside it to the point where it would be virtually indiscernible given the fact that you're looking through all these trees and even without the foliage on it, it's very difficult to see this. I mean, as you drive past this lot, this is actually zoomed in. To see it better, you really have to stop and get out of your car and 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 actually walk closer to the house to be able to see that see it at this point. 
And then as you drive across, there's at, there's really not any place here to where that roof is going to be sticking out in view to where it's going to be incredibly visible to people driving past. Uh, at the same time, we're only proposing to put this on, sorry, I had this, I had, uh, on, on only on a portion of this roof, we're not actually filling out this whole roof. And if you can see from, let me come into here, as you can see here, looking overhead on our panel layout, a portion of the panels themselves are actually behind the roof that's for the garage that pitches up in front of this so that it's even less, so that makes it virtually in, invisible from the road. And that the only portion that we do have visible is would actually be fitting within your new regulations if you were to approve those. And that would be that we would be at 50% or less of that roof space that we're utilizing for those panels at this point. Um, I, you know, I can only say that when you're looking at, when you're looking at roofs and solar panels and talking about the busyness or how it stands out or how they don't look good, this was a project that we installed over at Lake St. Louis. This is a south-facing roof. It's about a 612 pitch. Sir, these can these I actually for a second. Sure. Um I'll, I'm still seeing the uh, photograph of the house. I if you're showing something different, oh, I'm not I'm seeing. I'm sorry. It. Okay, let me uh let me show. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it wasn't flipping through. Okay. Here we go. Okay, then can you see this house now? Yes, I can. Yeah, okay. So this is a house that we that we installed on and and I agree that you do that if you have like um simple if you simplify your forms and shapes, you go with a black on black uh panel on top of a dark roof that in a lot of cases this this panel actually has a bit of a silver has a actually is a I can zoom in on it. It has a uh, it has a silver bit or, or a um, a light or a silver silver frame on it. But what I'd like to point out is that what's more noticeable on this roof, being that it's a dark roof and with dark panels being placed on top of them, you actually see the skylight and the and the vent stack that's not painted to match the roof sooner than you would actually visualize these roof panels or these solar panels on top of this roof. And and I. And with this house, the with our proposed with our proposed layout on the roof that's on our existing home that we're that we're going with on Thunder Road, that is a dark roof and would have dark panels on it with dark frames and with very limited silver busing within those panels to where with the trees, and it's about 50 trees out and 40 trees out in front of the house, that the visibility of those panels would be reduced to where it would be virtually unnoticeable as people would be driving past or even noticeable for people looking down and trying to visualize it. And given the fact that, and I'd just like to reiterate that it is 30 feet down from the road level. Uh, so the roofs up, the roof itself is down below roof level. So as you're looking at your car, as you're driving past, you would be looking out over it and you would be looking at the expanse that takes that's, that's visible above it. Uh, I'd like to, I, I hope that you take that into consideration when you're looking at this. So that, you know, my three, my three points is that it's a dark roof, that it's, we're not utilizing um, greater than 50% of that portion that is visible from the road that it's 30 feet down from the road level, that the roof itself is not at street level, and that it's shielded by the trees, by the existing trees that are out in front of it. And I think that's, Good if chair. you have any questions or anything like that that you'd like to ask me, I'd be more than happy to answer. All right, thank you for your comments. Um, does the commission have any questions or comments? I, I have one, just right, Commissioner remember, Jackson. whenever, Whenever this comes before us to vote, it's up the street for me. I'm going to have to abstain. And I know we see a lot of these. So please do your best to remind me. I'm sure I'll catch it. But thank you. All right. Thank you. Mayor Bowen. I have a question. This may be, a, I think it's a procedural one, maybe for the city attorney. But given the, the, the you know, the action of the commission earlier this evening, um, if there was an interest in a postponement of this, 
would it be in order to do that, i.e. until such time as the commission has looked at the new, the, the, the broader issue here, you know, the new legis potential legislation, um, would a motion to postpone be in order now as to that, you know, to wait till that happens? Or would we need to wait till for the department's informational report to make that motion to postpone? So wait until then to do it? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, seeing no further comments, a motion to close the public hearing. All right. um, motion by Commissioner Cohn, seconded by uh, Commissioner Broyles. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion close. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Newberry, PZ 11-22. PZ 11-22, Thomas Downey, 2638 Windcrest Falls Drive, Wildwood, Missouri, 63005, care of Straight Up Solar, 11693, Lowburn Park Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63146. A request for a conditional use permit, CUP in the R1A 22,000 square foot residence district with a planned residential development overlay district. Street address 2638 Windcrest Falls Drive, locator number 21U210370 for the installation of roof-mounted solar panels, which are to be so situated on a dwelling as to be visible from the adjoining roadway. This request is to be reviewed in accordance with Chapter 415.120 R1A 22,000 square foot residence district regulations of the City of Wildwood Zoning Ordinance, which establishes standards and requirements for the installation of solar panels. The requested permit is required due to the panel's placement on the front-facing area of the roofs of the dwelling, thereby causing them to be visible from the adjoining roadway, Ward 2. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Vunich? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As is referenced in the report, the Planning and Zoning Commission voted on the Department of Planning's information report with recommendation not to support the front-facing components of the solar energy system. A draft letter of recommendation was prepared for the November 7th meeting of the commission, and at that time, the matter was postponed to accommodate the discussion we had tonight on the regulations themselves. Stating that, Tonight, the letter of recommendation in draft form is ready for final action by the Planning and Zoning Commission, and it does reflect the recommendation for denial that occurred at the October 3rd, 2022 meeting. If there are any questions, the department would be glad to answer them at this time. I'll make a motion to deny. Um, um, motion by Commissioner Jackson, is there a second? Second by Commissioner Broyles. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, roll call vote. Oh, question. Okay, Go, Ms. Commissioner Halfrey. Are you denying the recommendation? No, I, I guess I'm agreeing with, yes. we're gonna deny the- The request. The request, so motion to deny. We well, it, yes, motion to approve the, the denial. Okay, there we go, I would amend it. Motion to approve the denial. Assume the second is agreeable to that. Thank you. So we say yes. No. Correct. Yes. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Clayton. Yes. Commissioner Deppler. So I did have one question. I mean, is it more appropriate to postpone this again since we are still in um, discussions over the regulations regarding solar panels? Ms. Deppler, that's certainly an option of the commission, although there is a motion on the floor at this time, but a postponement would, I would defer uh, to our expert she, on this. She could, anyone could make a motion to postpone it. It would trump uh, the main motion. However, um, I don't know that in this instance. Since we're voting, if that's something you'd be in favor of, I would say vote no on the motion and then make a new motion. She, she, anyone can make a motion to postpone, I think, before the vote occurs. Oh. Right? Well, so so my thought is, though, uh, and I say this with uh, all due respect to um, Commissioner Deppler and her intent, just looking at the photos and so forth, given the, the commission's motion uh, on the macro, you know, larger issue tonight, I don't, 
foresee this residence being able to comply necessarily, but but I think that a motion to postpone would be in order. That's the answer to the question. And I would defer to the so, city attorney. So then I will make a motion to postpone. So we're fully aligned across, you know, all regulations. Is there a second on that motion? All right. Um, seeing no second, I, the motion to postpone fails for a lack of second. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Let's start the vote over just to be consistent. Yes, sir. Commissioner Clayton? Yes. Commissioner Deppler? No. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Helfrey? Abstain. Commissioner Cohn? Yes. Commissioner Broyles? Chair Beatty? No. Mayor Bolin? Yes. All right. Motion passes with two dissenting. Mr. Chair, you'll give me a moment here. Oh, okay. I have a five to two vote with one abstention. I believe the bylaws require that an action such as this uh, gain six votes of the commission to proceed to the council. Yes, typically a final action of the Planning and Zoning Commission requires six affirmative votes regardless of the motion. Again, with the city attorney, I would defer to him, but our bylaws are fairly clear. I would suggest that it would move forward uh, with if no change is made, it fail for a lack of a majority. And the implication, oh, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead. Point, yes. point of information. If I may ask, then the implication would be that it's not approved? That's certainly how the department would uh, interpret it, uh, given that the motion was for denial, okay. not approval. So either way, it gets from point A to point B in the same way. For the most part, I would say yes. And again, I would look at Mr. Pryor. Yeah, I would say that I would like to you turn your microphone. Yeah, if, if nobody gets the vote, doesn't pass before the piece, the essence is not. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, uh, PZ 15-22, Mr. Newberry. PZ 15-22, Glenn Scott, 16245, Wincrest Ridge Court, Wildwood, Missouri, 63005, care of Helio Solar Power, 1017 South Vegas Street, Alhambra, California, 91801. A request for a conditional use permit CUP in the R1A 22,000 square foot residence district with the Plain Residential Development Overlay District PRD. Street address 16245 Wincrest Ridge Court, locator number 210, excuse me, 21U 240557. For the purpose of installing of roof mounted solar panels, which are to be so situated on the dwelling as to be visible from the adjoining roadway. This request is to be reviewed in accordance with chapter 415.120 R1A 22,000 square foot residence district regulations of the city of Wildwood zoning ordinance, which establishes standards and requirements for the installation of all solar panels. The requested permit is required due to the panels placement on the front facing area of the roofs of the dwelling, thereby causing them to be visible from the adjoining roadway, Ward 2. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Vunich. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, just to kind of update you on the timeline, public hearing was held on this matter on October 3rd. The department was prepared to proceed forward with its information and report with recommendation at the November 7th meeting of the commission. And at that time, the matter was postponed again to accommodate the discussion we held tonight at this meeting. The department has prepared the information report with recommendation. And in this instance, it is not supportive of granting the conditional use permit for the front facing components of the solar energy system or the rationales provided in the report. As the commission is aware with any conditional use permit, there is a requirement that four criteria be met and all four of those criteria must be met favorably. 
In this instance, not all four of them are complied with, and therefore the reason for the denial. If there are any questions regarding this particular matter, after it is open for discussion or a motion is made, partner would be glad to answer them at this time. Thank you, Mr. Brunich. Motion to approve the denial. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. All right. So motion to approve by Commissioner Jackson, seconded by Mayor Bullen. Any discussion on the motion? Yeah, just wanted to uh, Commissioner point Clayton. clarification. If uh, if we make changes in these policies, uh, legislation, they are free to reapply. Is that not correct? Yes, there are certain prohibitions and how quickly you can re reapply, typically no, no sooner than 12 months. But certainly, as we go through the process with the regulations themselves, um, it, it will not take 12 months, but certainly there will be a gap of time. But yes, the, anyone can reapply after they've met the requirement of the timeline. Just some clarification. I've made the motion to approve the denial on the other one and this one. They, they're pretty, I don't, I don't ever see them making it even with the changes. That's why. Any further discussion? I believe Ms. Commissioner Depp Depler. I, I will just, you know, state the same argument that I made before the last one. I mean, I I agree that it would be a stretch that they would, this would be approved with the changes to our regulations, but I think it would be more appropriate to postpone the the um, vote until after the regulations have been instituted. So just wanted to state that again. All right. Would you like to make a motion to postpone? That would trump the recommendation yeah. on the floor. I'll I motion. I'm assuming it will have the same outcome as before, but yeah, I'll state my. All right. Motion by Commissioner Deppler. Is there a second? All right. Seeing none, uh, motion fails for lack of a second. Um, any further discussion on the original motion? All right. Um, seeing none, roll call vote. Commissioner Deppler? No. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Helfrey? Yes. Commissioner Ward? Excuse me, Commissioner Cohn? <laughs> Yes. Commissioner Broyles? Yes. Commissioner Clayton? Yes. Chair Beatty? No. Mayor Bolin? Yes. All right. Thank you. That one, I believe, is six to two. So that one would pass, correct? Yes, sir. All right. All right. PZ 17 22. Um, Mr. Brunich? PZ 17 22, 17011 Manchester Road. Kevin Amont, care of Jennifer James, Altia Land Surveyors, 3906 South Old Highway 94, St. Charles, Missouri, 63304. A request for a change in zoning from the NU Non-Urban Resident District to the R3 10,000 square foot resident district upon a property that is 0 0.9 acres in size, which is located on the northeast corner of Manchester Road in Lindy Lane. Street address, 17011 Manchester Road, St. Louis County Locator Number 24V, 510715. The subject property is designated the neighborhood edge district under the current town center regulating plan as adopted by the Planning and Zoning Commission on June 7, 2021. This particular location is in Ward 8. Thank you, Mr. Brunich. Mr. Newberry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, the department has prepared for your consideration tonight an information report with recommend a recommendation. Um, for the request that was just read into the record, as was noted in what Mr. Vinish described into the record, the location of the property is at the corner of Manchester Road and Lindy Lane and is 0.9 acres in size. Uh, currently on the property, there is an ex existing dwelling um, that was built in 1941. Um, the petitioner has stated to the department and at the public hearing that he intends to retain that dwelling on the property. Uh, it's offered for rental use today. He plans to continue that 
and the intent of the change in zoning as the petitioner stated at the hearing was had some tax property tax implications but also has submitted a preliminary design for the potential future subdivision of the overall lot into two additional lots that would be used for single family residences totaling in three total lots um, in this instance um, the requested change in zoning would need to occur to accommodate uh, any future subdivision of the property um, given its non-conforming status being in new non-urban residence district zoning um, regardless uh, if the lot is not subdivided in the future or the near future um, the requested change in zoning will address this non-conformity um, for the property that's located in the town center area uh, in the report the department provides its analysis identifying certain um, components of the proposed rezoning request um, and its compliance with the neighborhood edge district requirements of the town center which is the land use category uh, designation for the site in the town center regulating plan um, the department's recommendation to the planning and zoning commission is to support the request for the change in zoning from the nu non-urban residence district to the r3 10,000 square foot residence district uh, the department would like to, uh, as with other properties nearby, note one item. Um, the department believes that the public space requirements associated with a, a property such as this uh, are, are difficult. And in this instance, the application of this, um, excuse me, and therefore the, it's the department's recommending to the commission that the property owner be required to dedicate 10 feet of a public easement along the property's frontage onto Lindy Lane. Again, that requirement has been consistent with two other rezoning requests along Lindy Lane. Um, the purpose for the dedication would be for a future sidewalk or trail facility at that location. Um, again, that's consistent with that. That recommendation is consistent with previous properties on Lindy Lane as well as Etherton Road in in the nearby area. So again, uh, the department uh, you have before you tonight a report with a recommendation. Um, for the approval of the requested change in zoning from the non-urban residence district to the R3 10,000 square foot residence district. And the department will conclude its presentation with that and be available for any questions that the commission might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Um, Commissioner Helfrey. Uh, I move to accept the, the city's recommendation, including the uh, easement adjustment. Second by Commissioner Broyles. I saw your your hand first <laughs> and thank you for including the sidewalk easement I really as a neighbor somewhat of a neighbor I really appreciate that um and uh, any further discussion seeing none roll call vote Commissioner Helfrey yes Commissioner Cohn yes Commissioner Broyles? Yes. Commissioner Clayton? Yes. Commissioner Deppler? Yes. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Chair Beatty? Yes. Um, Mayor Bolin is absent currently. And that concludes the roll call vote. Thank right. you. So motion carries 7 and 0? Yes, sir. All right. And Mr. Vunich, uh, PZ 18 22. Thank you, Mr. Chair. PC 18 22 Swizzer, Riding Stable, Kara Kristen Swizzer, 1351 Shepherd Road, Wildwood, Missouri 63038. A request for a conditional use permit in the NU Non Urban Resident District for an eight acre parcel of ground that is located on the west side of Shepherd Road, north of its intersection with Christmas Valley Road and Thiel Drive. Street address 1351 Shepherd Road, St. Louis County Locator Number 20V 220171. Proposed use, a riding stable inclusive of a building and portion of the designated site for the purposes of offering riding lessons to the general public for commercial purposes. This particular location is in Ward 3. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vernich. Mr. Newberry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Department of Planning has prepared for your consideration an information report with recommendation regarding the matter that was just read into the request excuse read into the record uh, the petitioner has requested a conditional use permit for a writing staple uh, on her, on the prop sub subject property uh, the writing stable would offer writing lessons to the general public by appointment uh, utilizing equine currently owned and kept by the property owner the subject property is in is eight acres in size and currently has an outbuilding on it for the keeping 
of horses, um, pasture fence areas uh, and a fenced riding area as well is currently on the property. Uh, in conjunction with the single family residence where the, the petitioner currently resides. Access to the site is via an ingress egress easement from Shepherd Road, but the subject property does not have any frontage onto um, Shepherd Road. Uh, as was just as was described by the petitioner at the public hearing, um, she, she would intend to use her two horses and one pony to offer um, lessons on riding lessons on the property. Uh, the maximum number of lessons per day would be three to five, and the lessons would last approximately 30 minutes each. Um, in reviewing this request and formulating its recommendation, the department first must determine if the proposed use is consistent with the city's master plan. Uh, the department believes that given the large lot de development pattern in the area, the long-standing equine uses in the rural areas of the city, and the requested use being identified as a possible conditional use under the uh, the current zoning district designation of the property, the Inunana Urban Residence District, um, the department believes that the requested use is appropriate and anticipated under the city's master plan. Next, in the department's review, as with any conditional use permit, um, the request, the four criteria for granting uh, a conditional use permit under the city's regulations must also be met. The department had, has reviewed these four items and has determined that these criteria are met by this low impact proposal for limited riding lessons on the subject property. Therefore, the department is presenting its recommendation uh, that based on the analysis that's been provided in, in its report that the commission support the conditional use permit for this facility. Uh, this favorable recommendation is based on it meeting the set of conditions that were pro provided uh, and put forth in attachment B of the report that was is being presented to you tonight. Um, the department will note these conditions uh, establish the parameters of the operation, uh, including, but not limited to, the number of equine that are permitted at the property, the hours of operation allowed, uh, provisions for pu parking when the public visits the property, and other requirements that are typical of a use such as this. And lastly, one of those commission, one of those conditions the department would like to point out is that uh, the conditional use permit will be reviewed again if approved by the commission in five years and then every three years thereafter to ensure compliance with the requirements of the permit. Um, in conclusion, uh, for the reasons stated, the department is recommending the commission grant the requested conditional use permit and the department's available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Is there questions or a motion? Commissioner Count? Make a motion to approve. Thank you. Um, second by Commissioner Helfrey. Um, any further discussion? I just have one quick question. I think you might have covered it. You know, when they're unloading horse trailers, there's ample space to do that. That's not parked out on the side of the road or anything like that. Based on the site visit the department conducted and the site plan provided, uh, I, I don't believe that's an issue, um, as well as the notion that the two horses and one pony that plan to be used. Okay. Already, no big deal. Okay. Already live on the property. I, I, okay. But just if they're having people come in and out sometimes, that's, that's fine. I'm fine with the horses. Right about. The horses that will be used to offer the riding lessons are only those uh, owned by the property owner. Any further questions? Um, I had one. Uh, just with the, say at some point, um, the owner sells the property. Does the conditional use permit get canceled with the owner? Or does it carry over? It carries with the land, sir. Okay. So basically, as long as someone's still using it for offering the lessons, we it would just automatically come up every five and then three years. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll call vote. Commissioner Cohn. Yes. Commissioner Broyles? Yes. Commissioner Clayton? Yes. Commissioner Deppler? Yes. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Helfrey? Yes. Uh, Chair Beatty? Yes. Mayor Bull, oh, excuse me, Mayor Bowen's absent. Thank you. All right, motion carries. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Vunich, uh, the PZ 16-07. 
A response to a communication from Sharla Bates, project manager, Falk and Foster, being dated December 12, 2022, regarding PZ 16-07 Verizon Wireless, care of Dolan Realty Advisors, LLC, which seeks the Planning and Zoning Commission's review and action on a requested change to the current conditional use permit, CUP, governing an existing 150-foot monopole, pardon me, monopole telecommunications tower and related equipment shelter. The tower and shelter are located on a 68-acre tract of land, Rockwood Valley Middle School, and more specifically on the north side of Babbler Park Drive, State Route BA, East of Pond Road. Street address 1220 Babbler Park Drive, St. Louis County Locator Number 21W230062. NU Non-Urban Resident District with a Conditional Use Permit, CUP. Such change would thereby allow for the installation of antennas that are not flush-mounted type inside the tower's canister, but attached onto its exterior with associated cabling and other equipment. This particular location is in Ward 3. Thank you, Mr. Vunich. Uh, Ms. Er, Ms. Ripito. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission, um, the request that Mr. Vunich just read in direct, into the record pertains to a conditional use permit that was originally approved in um, 2008 that authorized, authorized uh, the 115 foot telecommunications tower that you see um, in the photograph. Um, uh, it's um, located at 1222 Babbler Park Drive, which is also um, where Rockwood Valley Middle School is. Um, it's It can be accessed off the gravel drive that uh, goes off the parking lot, um, the existing parking lot of the school, and thus also accessed um, via the same access drive that accesses the school. Um, the design, as you can see, is a essentially a flagless flagpole that includes the ability for co-location of up to six other telecommunication providers. Um, this request is to amend the conditional use permit for the installation of an increased number of antenna um, that include a non-flush mounted um, array outside the structure at approximately 98 feet. Um, the Department of Planning has prepared a draft of a uh, favorable, favorable recommendation uh, that's included in your packets that notes the rationales for supporting this amendment includes similar installations at other locations in order to increase service, as well as uh, the location of the tower is hundreds of feet from the nearest roadway. Um, this is a photograph taken from the roadway um, at Babbler Park. Uh, entering the school, and it's not visible from the street. Um, it's also uh, hundreds of feet from the nearest residential houses. Um, the proposed area doesn't extend more than two feet off of uh, the pole. Um, so accordingly, the impacts will be minimal, um, and it benefits the community. So to my, tonight, the department is seeking uh, the commission's consideration and action on this item. Um, in order to be forwarded on to the city council. Um, the, uh, also included in your packet is a copy of the existing conditional use permit, which shows the amendments. It would amend section 2G um, to reflect no more than two installations on the exterior. However, all cabling shall be installed on the interior of the support structure and section 8H to reflect the two-year renewal beginning in uh, January um, uh, provided this is approved. Um, and so with that, that concludes the department's presentation. Um, but the uh, draft of the letter is formatted uh, in a way to be forwarded to city council. If there are any questions, Mr. Vunage, Mr. Newberry, and I are here to answer them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ripito. Um, any discussion or a motion? Um, motion to approve. All right, motion by Commissioner Helfrey, second by Commissioner Clayton. Um, any further questions? All right, seeing none, roll call vote. Commissioner Broyles? Yes. Commissioner Clayton? Yes. Commissioner Deppler? Yes. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Helfrey? Yes. Commissioner Cohn? Yes. Chair Beatty? Yes. Thank you. Motion, motion carries, thank you. All right. Um, last on the agenda, uh, site development plan for PZ 31-21. 
A recommendation report on a preliminary plat for the Wesley Park subdivision, PZ31-21 Wesley Park, that has been submitted by Wayland Custom Homes, Inc., R3 10,000 square foot residence district, neighborhood edge district of the town center plan, east side of Center Avenue at its intersection with Bordeaux Walkway. Street address 2630 Center Avenue, St. Louis County locator number 24V510034, which supports the approval of the four lot residential subdivision on this 1.4 acre tract of land with each of these properties being over 13,000 square feet in area, Ward 8. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Vinich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, the department has prepared for your consideration tonight a recommendation report regarding this preliminary plat. Just in terms of process, before a record plat can be submitted to City Council, a preliminary plat must be presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission and favorable action taken upon it. Without favorable action, the plat at City Council cannot proceed. In this particular instance, Whalen Custom Homes Incorporated is seeking to subdivide this one plus acre lot into four properties. The four properties would in, have upon them single family detached dwellings of a similar nature than what, to what has been built by the same petitioner on Center Avenue, uh, specifically Old Town Park and Stone Mill. The review of the preliminary plat indicates compliance at several levels. First and foremost, in terms of the town center plan, this particular site is designated the land use category neighborhood edge, which limits the development of any property to single family detached dwellings on individual lots. Along with that particular component, there are a number of steps that are being proposed as part of the preliminary plat to ensure compliance to the town center plan. Amongst them, all of the dwellings will have side entry garages that are not visible from the fronting street, in this case, Center Avenue. The use of landscaping to enhance the architecture of the building and in past, Mr. Whalen has been successful with the style, design, and character of the dwellings with the Architectural Review Board. In fact, one dwelling is under construction since it is a single legal lot of record, and that particular dwelling did receive approval from the Architectural Review Board according to the architectural guidelines of the Town Center Plan. This particular area is almost entirely single-family detached dwellings on individual lots, so in terms of compatibility, what Mr. Whalen is proposing is consistent. And then finally, although this particular site is not the subject of an overlay district, our planned residential development overlay district, the R3, 10,000 square foot resident district regulations of the zoning ordinance, and then the subdivision and development regulations ensure that there will be all of the components that will make this particular four lot subdivision consistent with the area and an outcome that I believe will be very successful for the city. Therefore, tonight, the department has prepared a recommendation report that is favorable to this preliminary plat. I would note that Mr. Whalen is in attendance, but cannot speak. And certainly if you have any questions regarding it afterwards, you can kind of converse with him. But tonight, the department is seeking a favorable action. Are there any questions, Ms. Ripito, Mr. Newberry, and I are available to answer them at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vunich. Uh, Ms. Commissioner Helfrey. So thank you, Mr. Vunich. First of all, I would make a recommendation to approve, but I have a question since sure. you're standing there. Um, when I was reading this current request on number one, it says this residential subdivision does not include public space dedications but will utilize extensive area of amended soils. So are we not requiring of these homes what we required on Lindy Lane where they dedicated property? I, I guess I'm asking for my own understanding, please. So to kind of give just a very quick background, when the public space requirements were adopted by the city, stormwater components were not authorized as a credible charge. However, as the phase two Clean Water Act came into play and the Metropolitan St. Louis Sewer District started to apply them, what we found is between right-of-way dedications, public space, um, and others, there wasn't much room for the actual dwellings themselves. And so what inevitably happened, the city council supported changing the public space requirements to allow the credible 
that lot to allow stormwater management under phase two Clean Water Act to be credible. And so from that perspective, we're not getting active public space, but we are getting the required public space. To answer your question specifically, Mr. Whalen is a partner along with the city of Wildwood in developing Center Avenue, now a public street. So yes, there will be a dedication of, of, of land for public purposes for Center Avenue. And the intent is to build an improved street and hopefully with at least one side of the street having a pedestrian facility. Thank you very much. So is that, oh, one, one thing and then I'll come to you. Is, so is that a sidewalk in front of those four homes? That is actually the dedication that could be used for the sidewalk. Okay. And just to kind of update you, I did mention Center Avenue now is a public street. Uh, 21 property owners, including Mr. Whalen, agreed to sign quick claim deeds, releasing any rights that they might claim. We've done, for the most part, a revised survey to basically update the information we've had, which started back in 2016. And the intent is to basically develop a road plan that ultimately will come to the Planning and Zoning Commission that will improve safety and also have an aesthetic and pedestrian component. All right, thank you. Commissioner Broyles. <laughs> yes. Four. Yes, I think everybody in City Hall and in that general area are looking forward to the improvements finally coming. And so it took a while. Um, certainly the Department of Office apologized to multiple people about the time frame. But once we settled on an approach that for the most part was the quick claim deeds, it, 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 it was a success finally. So Later, oh. <laughs> yes. I concur. We we have been successful. And so you're now you're saying there is a possibility we at least get half half or one side of a, a sidewalk on one side. Yes. Just so you know, the quick claim deed did not ask for any additional dedication, just rights. So what we have is a 30 foot wide right of way. We've collected additional 10 foot, 10 feet of dedication with Old Town Park here with Wesley Park. And so we're minus one property, the Barrens, to being able to make a consistent connection with at least the sidewalk. And certainly okay. that'll be a conversation that I hope the city will have with the Barrens and provide them an incentive, so, so to speak, mm -hmm. to make that dedication. I haven't been running much of late, but as someone who used to run that, to try to find further, to try to lengthen my runs without doing out and backs, that street's dark and narrow at night. And so a sidewalk is, I, I'm happy to hear that it's still a possibility. Well, certainly, like I say, we've got four lots that's dedicating. In this mm -hmm. case, we had four lots dedicated further to the north on the same side of the street, or mm -hmm. minus one. The yeah. other side of the street is a little more difficult because we have utility poles there. And to mm -hmm. make that connection or to increase the width and make that improvement, yeah. we'd have to do utility reloc relocation, which is always more expensive. Yeah. I, I mean, as long as you have one side for pedestrians, I, I get the constraints. That That's plenty. Always like sidewalks on both sides, but sometimes what you like and what you can do are two different things. And I see plenty of cities that only require them on one side, and it just seems weird. <laughs> Asymmetrical versus symmetrical. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Humphrey made a motion. We still need a second. I thought you said before I do. And I made it up. Yeah. All right. We do need a second. Second. All right. Seconded by Commissioner Jackson. Any further discussion? Thank you. All right. Uh, roll call. Oh, do we not. Oh, roll call vote. Commissioner Deppler. Yes. Um, Commissioner Jackson. Yes. Commissioner Helfrey? Yes. Commissioner Cohn? Yes. Commissioner Broyles? Yes. Commissioner Clayton? Yes. And Chair Beatty? Yes. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, with that, um, can I?
get to a, get a motion to adjourn if no one has any other comments. I'm making oh. a motion to adjourn. All right, by Commissioner Helfrey, second by Commissioner Clayton. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, any abstain? We're closed, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.